Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we'll start with our intention, which is the translated intention of Imam al Haddad. Bismillah. So repeat after me. I intend to learn and to teach, to benefit and to be benefited, to remind and to be reminded, to call to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger, to guide and to be guided by sound proof and correct knowledge, to seek the countenance of my Lord, nearness to him and his reward. I mean, um, I mean, we're also here by the intention to expose ourselves to the mercy of Allah, by the intention to ask Allah to grant us an elevation, that he would grant us a proximity to the Prophet of Allah that would, that would rectify all of our affairs, rectify our complete spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical state. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless us at the seal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may illuminate our minds and our hearts, that it may grant us an expansion in our breasts and our chests, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless us to be dignified by it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow us to be in close proximity to the Prophet in dunya wa asirah, that he would visit us in our dreams and that we would have a chance to visit him in Medina. And then, of course, that we will be resurrected with him and enter into Jannah with him. Allahumma Amin. So, with that being said, um, I'd like to discuss today's topic, inshallah, is the Battle of Uhud. So, the last time that we were together, we discussed the Battle of Badr. And subhanAllah, it's interesting because at, even we were ending uh, right before Ramadan, our last class right before Ramadan. And it's in, in Badr, subhanAllah, happened during the month of Ramadan. And so that's the time we actually com commemorate on the 17th of Ramadan, uh, the, the battle of Badr, subhanAllah, and like to call out the names of the martyrs. And so the battle of Uhud was literally like a response from the Quraysh about the level of defeat that they experienced during uh, during the Battle of Badr. Like there was just a, an overwhelming rage and an overwhelming sense of need for revenge, to avenge their fathers, their brothers, their uh, sons who had actually been martyred during the Battle of Badr, subhanAllah. Uh, and it was something that just like the Quraysh religion boiling because it was such an upset to them because it, it's not something they ever expected would have happened, right? They went into the battle thinking, oh, this will be easy. This will be a piece of cake. We'll wipe them out. We'll go home. They did not see the Muslims at that point as any, as any threat to them at all. And yet, subhanAllah, they lead that battle severely defeated and, and deeply humiliated. Uh, and they lose some of the big leaders of Quraysh, right? The, 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 the very important leaders of Quraysh like Umayya, Neyma, like, I'm sorry, Umayya, like uh, uh, Abu Jahl, they lose them, subhanAllah, in that particular battle. And so that's that's a big loss to, you know, for Abu Jahl to have passed away. And so now uh, Abu Sufyan bin Harb is actually the leader of the Quraysh. And there are a group of men, uh, including Ikrama, who is the son of Abu Jahl, that comes uh, to Abu Sufyan and says, listen, we have got to avenge, right? Including the son of Umayma, who uh, was killed, Bilal ibn Rabah, who was the former slave owner of Bilal ibn Rabah, that when his son, you know, and hears about the loss of his father, they, they just go to him and like plead, we've got to avenge our fathers. And so Abu Sufyan was able to actually um, to keep some of the spoils, basically some of what was left from some of those caravans. Abu Sufyan had actually saved some of those caravans. And so they went to those who were the owners of the caravans and asked, can we use this wealth basically to wage a war, right? In their terms, to wage a war against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And subhanAllah, uh, they actually agreed that was, this was a very big deal. And so they, uh, you know, basically sold everything that was in those caravans and it came back to be about 15,000 dirhams, right? So if you can imagine like $15,000. Uh, for this particular war that they had raised. 
And subhanAllah, they gave the profit to the care, you know, to the owners of the caravan, but then they were able to take, or should they, uh, they gave what was due to the, to the owners of the caravan and took the profit in order to be able to, uh, to wage this war. And so now it was subhanAllah, just, it was on. They were ready. They were armed and ready and, and fueled with so much rage, subhanAllah. And that even uh, one of the, they had gone to the poets and asked, you know, these poets, it was like a, literally like a smear campaign um, that they waged against the Prophet Sallallahu but before the battle began, when they went to these poets, they literally wanted to uh, do two things. Of course, they wanted to smear our beloved messenger of Allah, and he said, that's what said on his character, and to deny what his message was about, to say that he was actually trying to separate family members and trying to separate tribes and trying to um, deviate from the religion of their forefathers, when in reality, he was trying to call them back to the true religion of their forefathers, subhanAllah. So this was the, the smear campaign against the Prophet, so the Lord has sent them. But in addition to that, the poets were actually a kind of like giving odes to those who had passed away in the battle of Badr to kind of you know arouse in them this sense of like we need to avenge their death and so subhanAllah they have used all kinds of tactics in order to get these poets to go to these different tribes and to actually speak about it so if you can imagine like in our day and time today it would be like you know, on every new on every news channel, on every channel that's playing, and every you know, everywhere you go, you're seeing these particular messages being spread, right? About the Prophet so against the, the beloved messenger of Allah, and then for um the those who were martyred, right, who were killed, not the shuhada, clearly uh the disbelievers who were martyred in this battle of Badr. And so this just again just became fuel for the fire. Now it's interesting uh that of course there's a there's like a, some targets that now that since they have lost some of their key leaders, they're looking for what key leaders who are with the beloved messenger of Allah, he said that they could uh that they could pinpoint and say, we're going, you know, they took Abu Jahl, they took Umay, so now we're going to take Hamza. I, they were just so before, of course, that Hamza was beloved to them. But now since he had sided with the Prophet Muhammad and had fought in that previous battle, that uh, and particularly that he killed Tuayma, which was um, a, a, a leader in that community. So the daughter of the one that Hamza had killed came to Wahshi. And Wahshi was known uh, for basically his... Uh, with, like his spearmanship, I guess you would say. He was known that he could hit a target from far and not miss. So he would be the equivalent of like a sniper today. And subhanAllah, uh, they told, he was at that particular time a slave. And what they promised him was his freedom, that if he could actually uh, kill Hamza, either Hamza, uh, or the beloved messenger of Allah, or Abu Bakr, or Omar, then any one of them, right now, he, what they're doing is targeting the leaders, that any one of them, if he was able to, to target them, to kill them, then he would have his freedom. And subhanAllah, it was, of course, this united, this, you know, uh, pushed in him, not so much that he wanted to, uh, that he had any personal feelings against Hamza or the Prophet them, but there was just this deep sense of wanting his own freedom. And so in that, uh, he signed up for this particular war. And so I want to just have, take a moment to be able to pull up some of the things that were important um, that led up to the particular battle itself, right? As we get ready, uh, when we look at how the battle begins, how it all begins, 
that, you know, there was this request to Abu Sufyan and then, you know, to wage war against the Muslims. And he agrees, right? And then we have, you know, they literally send out the different poets, as we mentioned, but Abu Sufyan makes a promise. He literally promises to not bathe. I, until he uh, is able to avenge the deaths and bother. He literally refuses to bathe. Right, that's that's like I, I I can't even imagine, you know. Of course, what he smelled like, um, but also just that feeling of like I'm not going to feel a sense of cleanliness until after this. And it, there's something so amazing because uh, there's so many things Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is showing us, right, about who He is, even in this particular battle. In the battle of Badr, we begin to witness Subhanallah the power of Allah Azza wa Jalla. I, in the, the greatness and the grandeur of Allah Azza wa Jal, in the battle of Uhud, what we begin to recognize is the immense mercy and compassion. And I'm, I'm going to get to that in the end, because as we list, of course, like the likes of Ikrama, who is the son of Abu Jahan, of course, Abu Sufyan, watching as we uh, even uh, Khalid ibn Walid, who is the leader at this time of the army, as we begin to list these people at the end, what we find out, hey, they're ending all, all of those who were some of the top, uh, you know, enemies of Islam and the Prophet وسلم, ended up having a different ending, subhanAllah. So in this week, we see Allah's mercy in turning the hearts, but we won't get there. Let me not uh, skip past, subhanAllah, you know, skip past some of the, the importance of, of these events. So as we go through um, some, again, of these particular things, the Prophet وسلم, has made this decision that he doesn't want to fight inside of Medina, that he wants to fight outside of Medina, right? Upon the, like uh, many of his followers kind of make this suggestion, like we should, you know, that we should march out, that we should fight, uh, fight outside of Medina. And there are a couple of things that, um, happened differently in this war that it, that actually never happened in the history of any other battle in the Arabian Peninsula. For example, this is the first time that women are actually invited to the battlefield. And it happens, and interestingly enough, it happens on both sides, right? Like, for example, there are about 15 women from the side of the Quraysh who actually join their army. And part of the reason they bring uh, the women right to the to the battle is about they want to actually they recognize the power of, of women's voices in terms of uh, them arousing men to continuously to fight right for the women to actually uh, kind of give odes to the men that have passed away and for this to kind of encourage men to continue to fight now on the side of the Muslims of course women play a much different role right that they are not uh, using their voice for the purpose necessarily of inciting men to war or enticing them to war, but actually women are on the battlefield in order to assist the wounded soldiers that they are playing in order to, uh, they, they're playing a role of, of support to those soldiers in terms of making sure that they have proper food and proper water, uh, that they have proper medical support. And then subhanAllah, uh, it, it becomes a little bit more involved. And so I will get to that in a, in a little bit, inshallah. So when we get to, uh, you know, just to kind of give that general overview right, is that what's the reason for the battle of Badr? Like, I mean, the battle of Badr, excuse me. The reason for the battle of Badr, number one, is to, to avenge what happens at Badr, right? The next thing is, is they want to regain some of their lost prestige. The Quraysh have lost a certain 
uh, image in the eyes of the women. They have lost it in the eyes of the general Arabian Peninsula when the news gets out that they have been defeated by the Muslims and that Medina at, at the helm, at the leadership of the Prophet is, is stronger, is literally the Muslims are now a force to be reckoned with. And so the Quraysh want to quell that. They want to just say that is not the case, that we are still in power, that we are still in control. And so the other thing is, is now Medina is also as a result of it, that, that win of Badr and the overtaking of the majority of the caravans, that the few that Abu Sufyan was not able to, uh, you know, not able uh, to say is that this wealth came back to the Muslims. So now the Muslims are also enjoying, uh, Medina is also taking a, a stronger place, more prestigious place commercially, right? They're getting financially stronger. And so this uh, was a very, like this was a very, very big deal, right? Very big deal. And so uh, it became important that they were like, you know what, we have got to, uh, regain some of this back. So I want to take this, inshallah. So when we look at uh, in the, the the battle, like who's coming, right? So on the side of the Quraysh, there are three thousand uh, men who come out, right? There are three thousand men and women total, uh, and seven hundred out of the three thousand have coats of mail. So they're they've got the the chain mail on, and there's about fifteen to sixteen women who participate in this battle and who's there Hind bit Usa and the, who is the wife of Abu Sufyan right and as we know she's the one who is really encouraging Wahshi as well like if you kill Hamza right the reward that we will give you right the granddaughter of Abu Jahan and Fatima, the sister of Khalid Walid. So these are some of the women who are prominent, who are on the side of the Quraysh. Then we have, uh, when it comes to, being able to pull this up, when it comes to who was, you know, what was happening on the side of the Muslims, we have, subhanAllah, uh, we, we have some of the greats who were actually, subhanAllah, amongst the women who were present. Um, they were Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and Um Salima, and we'll get to her strong role in this total. So now they're only total all together, right? Men and women, they're between 700 to 1,000. They're still, you know, one to three. They're still one third of the population of the Quraysh, right? And so remember, there were 700 on the side of the Quraysh who had coats of mail, who were heavily armed, armored, but there are only a hundred on the side of the Muslims, subhanAllah. Um, and so this was something that, you know, we begin to see the same, the same disparity is happening in terms of the amount of people as well as the, the resources. The Muslims are still the underdog in this situation, yet, Subhanallah, they still have, you know, in terms of their courage and their iman, and they're, they're, you know, ready to meet them on the battlefield. That doesn't change, subhanAllah. And so uh, going back, I want to be able to pull this up, inshallah, for us to be able to see one of the most powerful images for me is just the, is the mountain woman. Now today in Mecca, when we visit, uh, I'm sorry, when we go to visit, uh, make these trips sorry, to Mecca and Medina, when we go to the mountain of Uhud, Uhud is only about, you know, less than a third of what it was during the time of Rasulullah It is not actually at all uh, what it was, you know, at that particular, like, you know, we would say during its heyday, um, that it's much smaller. But at least we're able to kind of get a sense of exactly where uh, the Muslims were standing, right? Like where, and it's a, the Uhud, even though we think of it just as one, we usually look at Uhud as just the, the mountain like we see on our screen, but in reality, Uhud is a, is a, a range of mountains that are surrounding that particular area, right? That Uhud is a range of mountains. And so, subhanAllah, there is a bypass, right? And it's important to know that 
because it's going to play a, uh, a very important role in terms of what happens uh, in terms of the battle itself. And so when we look at long sorry, listen, no. when we look at subhanAllah, where the Prophet we will be able to see uh, where the first phase of the battle took place. And we saw that here, that it um, began here. And then the second phase of the battle happens. Uh, basically, they have to come on the other side of the, the pass, right? And so what's very famous, as we know about um, the battle of Uhud is that subhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, as, as it begins, right? The Prophet وسلم, is, is very heavy hearted and he's, you know, feeling he's, he's, consul he's consulting with his companions and he's taking their advice and their leadership, but sometimes against his own feelings, his own uh, sense of, you know, what he wanted to do, but for the sake of, of Shura, for the sake of them also, of course, they have skin in the game, that they're a part of it. Uh, he, you know, he needs to some of their advice as well. And this happens multiple times, it, it, you know, including during the time, during the Battle of Butter, it happens in the Battle of Trench, uh, where the Prophet sallam, takes advice from his companions. But this time he's slightly troubled by uh, that advice, subhanAllah. So as the, literally the battle begins on Saturday, but the Quraysh come and camp out Thursday and Friday. So before the, the battle actually begins, they arrive on Thursday. Now, meanwhile, when this is about three days in between Thursday and Friday, Saturday, before the battle begins, uh, Abbas, the, who was the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, the son of Abdul Muttalib, uh, is asked by the Quraysh to join to join the Polish army and he refuses right he refuses and he he sends a message as the Polish leave out he actually sends a message to the prophet so the Lord is them making it known what's happening what is the plot of the Quraysh. Walillah and Hamz, giving the prophet so the Lord is them and the Muslims the opportunity to prepare right to get ready knowing this is what they're plotting this is what they're planning. And subhanAllah, when they arrive and they, you know, they, they're camping out to the bit, of course, to almost a, a, what we consider a day's distance, the Prophet وسلم, sends out spies to see, like basically to, to, uh, to see, you know, what's there, how many people are with them, what's their weaponry look like, what's the kind of listening on their plans. And how do that? They're, they're reporting back to the Prophet. And this is important because we begin to see that the Prophet also has a stratagem to war, right? That he, one of the things that he's, uh, you know, of course, he's Rahmat and Ananin, and he's known as one of the, the, the greatest leader of all times. But that also included, uh, you know, what, what has been studied also is his military strategy. That our beloved Messenger of Allah, wasalam, there wasn't an area of life that he wasn't, subhanAllah, a leader and a guide in that. And so the same in the case of the Battle of Uhud. And so as the battle begins, the Prophet والسلام, has ordered, uh, particularly, right, as the as the battle begins first on, in a smaller area, the Prophet والسلام, has ordered uh, that there are archers on the mount, right, archers on the top, and so in order to enter into where Mount Uhud is, you the, the positioning of the Quraysh is that they would enter into look into valley level. So they would be already as they they're coming in at a disadvantage to the Muslims. Uh, and so the Prophet والسلام, ordered that the archers who are on the mound should not leave. And they're roughly between about 50 to 60 of them that the Prophet والسلام, gives instruction to. And some of them are indifferent, according to some of them for the Ansar, some of them from Bahajain. There are groups of people who actually have already known each other, been familiar with each other, know each other's fighting styles. And so that's also part of the Prophet والسلام, strategy. And he also used in the Battle of Badr that, that was very effective. And so the archers are on the mound. He gives them 
the very clear instruction, do not leave your post, no matter what. Do not leave your post unless or until I give you the command. Do not leave your post unless or until I give you the command. And so I love they, you know, agree to that. And of course, because this puts them in a particular position. Well, as the battle ensues, as the battle begins, the Muslims are literally, subhanAllah, the Muslims are just like, you know, like this just, just, uh, taking them down, taking them down and taking names, taking them down and taking names, subhanAllah, that they are um, enormously successful in the beginning of the battle. So much so that again now, uh, they are, uh, they, you know, they begin to retreat, right? They begin to retreat and they are, they're feeling there's a deep sense you know, there's a there's a deep sense of, of dread inside of the Quraysh. Like we have engaged them and subhanAllah, they're coming to defeat us again, right? And so this level of, of dread that's happening inside of them is just like, wow, how have they gained so much power, so much strength? So in the beginning of the battle, right, there's this general fighting, the Quraysh attack first, the Muslims are fighting uh, bravely, you know, they have the upper hand, right? They have the upper hand. Uh, you know, they, they've wounded and killed many on the Quraysh side to the point that the Quraysh begin to retreat. Now, as they are retreating, right, as they are retreating, uh, literally, this is that fateful moment that when the Quraysh literally start to run away, the archers on the mound who are, who have been instructed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to not move their post until the Prophet gives, unless or until the Prophet gives the command. They begin to believe the fight is over. It's over, right? They're, they're retreating. And so they pass, they begin to spread the message amongst them that they are retreating. And so they run, right, away uh, from the battlefield and they leave exposed all of the spoils of war that they've left with them. And so the archers of the mound seeing that said, hey, it's over, we won. They begin to cheer and they begin to descend from their position. And subhanAllah, there are some who, there are about 15 to 17 who are still standing, calling the others back, saying, no, come back. The Prophet ﷺ told us not to leave. And the ones who, about the 35 of them who have descended are saying to them, listen, he, yes, he told us that, right? But he was telling us that during the while it was war, while the war was on. But now the war is finished. So literally, they took this uh, the words of our beloved Messenger of Allah and began to put their own interpretation on it. Right, and the ones who were calling them back were saying, "No, he told us not to leave unless or until his command." Period. I, that was their position. But the ones who were descending were saying, yes, he said it. And he meant that while the war was going on. And so in that moment, they're just adding that, that small little uh, nuance, right? Even to what the Prophet ﷺ was saying, literally as they descended and began to collect some of the spoils of war, and they're the archers trying to call them back. Now we can imagine there are archers on the mound here, right? And the Prophet them, is actually standing guard, right, on, on this side of the mountain, on almost on the same, uh, nearly close to where the, the valley where he could see the battle very clearly happening down on the ground, as well as being able to see what's happening on top, as well as he has access to be able to see where the women are. 
why where the women and any wounded soldiers are being taken. Like that's the, the view he has from where he's standing. He can see what's happening on the on top, on the ground, on the front. He can he has access to be able to see where the women are. He's got a view of all of this. And when he sees the archers begin to descend, he, he recognizes this is going to create a vulnerability. And just as that happens, now that they are down, right, majority are down, the pass over here, right, uh, is now exposed. This side is now exposed. There's a, a, a pathway. And literally what happens is that Khalid then as they're retreating, right, as, the, as they are retreating, Khalid ibn Walid comes on this side, right? And begin to now, now position the Quraysh to be on top of the mountain. So this is important. You've got the Prophet them seeing this, witnessing what's about to happen. He is running up one side of the mountain and the Quraysh army is coming on the other side of the mountain. You only have a very few amount who are standing, who are still on, and majority of the Muslim soldiers are now on the ground. And the battle has turned, right? And the women, subhanAllah, there's one woman, Nusayba Um Amara, who is watching this event. She can see the Prophet running up the mountain. She can see the, the Quraysh actually running up the other side. She was in the tent with the women, known for her uh, medicinal care, for, you know, and she runs, right? She runs up. Uh, of the mountain, subhanAllah, uh, in order to intercept, to place her body as a shield. She uses her body as a shield uh, to stand between the Qurayshi army, right, and the beloved messenger of Allah, and he said that to us today, because the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he's coming to call back the soldiers, but he doesn't see how quickly the Qurayshi army are coming up the other side. But Umar can see both sides. And so she runs and intercepts them right at the moment before the Prophet uh, is actually struck. She intercedes with her body, subhanAllah. And the Prophet said, when I look to my right and I look to my left, all I could see was the sword of Umar. SubhanAllah, said all I could see, like the way and the viciousness, mashallah, the bravery and the, the skill in which she was fighting, that if I look to my right to fight, I found her sword in front of me, defending my life. And if I look to my left to fight, I found her sword, subhanAllah, defending me. And at this moment, now, the, now they realize, the soldiers who have left their posts are now realizing Oh my God, what's happened? What has happened? So now they're trying to run back to their post. Those uh, 12 to 15, uh, 12 to 17 are actually covering their two circles, right? One uh, that is circling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like this, and then another that is standing out, right? In order to fight, to defend off. Right there, but it's just a few of them against at this point tens, uh, you know, let's just say more and more and more of them who are coming to defeat the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi them. Um Amara takes a hit. As a matter of fact, they said that she takes around 21 stab wounds before Nusayba Um Amara radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, falls to the ground. Right, and as she's falling and the Quraysh are like basically literally like are, are coming at them in waves, right? Because now the, the target um, that they were looking for was which is Sayyidina Muhammad Sallam, is it has been exposed. And so they they strike the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first in his shoulder, right? It happens that he struck in his shoulder another uh, he struck in, on his uh, cheek, and the, his chain mail, the his, uh, the his chain metal helmet, where is is one of the because of the blow, a piece of it is actually ingrained into the cheek of the beloved messenger of Allah, and his tooth is chipped. 
subhanallah. The, the next, the third one comes and strikes uh, the helm, strikes here, the Prophet وسلم, and he falls to the ground. And subhanallah, immediately as he falls, uh, the Quraysh began to spread the word that Sayyidina Muhammad is dead. And they began to spread it like a wildfire. We have struck him, he has fallen. Muhammad وسلم, is dead. And they spread it. And of course, the, the Quraysh are cheering and become more uh, courageous. And the, the Muslims are feeling a deep sense of sadness and defeat. And so there's a, a small group of them that literally take the Prophet وسلم, whose body is limp along with Muhammad and they drag them uh, to one of the other, basically uh, in a, in a, like a, a small cave in the mountainside, right, in order to nurse them. And so as this word is spread that the beloved Messenger of Allah is dead, the battle takes another turn. And because now, subhanAllah, uh, there is there is a sense of defeat already inside of the Muslims. There is a sense of, of deep hurt already existing inside of the Muslims, and so Subhanallah, uh, this is when it, it it just becomes they literally lost hope, right? They 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 literally have just lost hope, and so the fighting Subhanallah almost becomes like one sided, right? It just becomes like one sided. Um, and as it becomes one-sided, subhanAllah, like the, you know, literally uh, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, are doing their best to just like try to maintain their composure for what has occurred, right? For what is, is has occurred, subhanAllah. Um, and literally in this particular uh, battle, they fought until the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, Hamza, by what she that we mentioned in the beginning, takes a spear and you know identifies exactly Hamza and throws it and strikes him right in uh, his upper cavity, piercing through him, piercing through his heart, as well as uh, through this area. And, SubhanAllah. Um, after Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and falls, they come and want to take uh, trophies from his body, right? And in taking trophies from his body, uh, they're dismembering him. And so, SubhanAllah, uh, after feeling a deep sense of victory, like we have, you know, we have. Um, we have, you know, taken the life of Sayyidina Muhammad Ali taking the life of Muhammad There's a sense of like we have, you know, done what we came to do. And they are extremely exhausted. Both sides are extremely exhausted. And they, they finally, you know, basically just dissipate, right? They, both armies just decide that this is it. We're leaving. That's it. Now they get back, you know, and need to get word. Uh, and of course, the word comes back that the Prophet has not passed away. Right? That he's he's wounded, but he hasn't passed away. And as a matter of fact, the Prophet as soon as he wakes up, he asks the first person he asks about is where is Um Amara. What is the state of Musaba? Right? And so they tell him, oh, oh Rasulullah, she has not woken up yet. She's still unconscious. So he goes to her bedside and he sits by her bedside, makes dua until she wakes up. And when she wakes up, he asks her, oh, Musaba, oh, Amara, what do you want for defending my life in this dunya? And she says, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be in Jannah with you. Like, that's, that's the whole point. I want to be in general with you. And he says, 
you have it. You have it. SubhanAllah. And so she is becomes one of the Ashana Masha of one of those who are promised, guaranteed Jannah. Then subhanAllah, they take the Prophet وسلم, to the battlefield to give an assessment, right? What is the state? What is the state of the condition? You know, who's left behind? And when this happens, when the Prophet وسلم, goes to give the assessment and he is a witness to uh, the body of his beloved uncle Hamza. It said that the Prophet وسلم, lets out a sound. He lets out a just a gut wrenching wail. Like he just he just is overwhelmed with sadness and overwhelmed um, that his beloved uncle is gone, right? And not only gone, but to see Hamza dismembered in this way. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, is just overcome with grief. And subhanAllah, when we look at the turn of this, you know, the, when we look at and we take some of the lessons from the battle of the book, of course, one of the first is that our victory in every aspect of our life is completely contingent. Real victory is completely contingent on our absolute obedience to Allah and his messenger. Without even saying, let me reinterpret, let me re, you know, uh, let, me, let me say we didn't mean it at this time. That was for that time. This is for now it's a different time. So now this no longer applies. And the, the sadness is that every one of us as Muslims have, have had that moment in the battle of Uhud. Every single one of us at some point have had that moment to say, well, this was for the Prophet and them. This was for that time, not for our time. Or this is what he meant by literally just taking a small and, and adding something that's more convenient for me because there's something I want. There's something I'm seeking. And so we literally just kind of change the meaning of the messenger, the words of the messenger of Allah, which in the end will only not only lead to our defeat, but to the defeat of the Muslims. And so subhanAllah, I can't imagine what it must have been like to, uh, you know, to when they literally, it was, wasn't only Hamza, the Muslims took a heavy toll, a heavy loss that day on the battle of Wood. Over 70 were martyred. Over 70 Muslims were martyred. Majority were from the Muhajiri, right? And uh, some of them from the Ansar. And so this was a this was a heavy, heavy, heavy defeat, right? Because in, in, interestingly enough, majority of those who defended the life of the Prophet وسلم, that particular day, right? Majority of them were from the Ansar. And so this had a huge uh, pain in the heart. This left a huge broken heartedness with the Mahajiri. Like, we've been with him. We've been with him since the days of Darul Arqam. How could we leave him in that moment? And how could we uh, leave Hamza? How could we leave the Muslims? And yet, and yet, it was a moment that the companions never spoke of again to each other. There was a pact given that we will not even mention. We will not even say anything about it. We just, we will admit our defeat, our shortcomings, but we will not speak of it. Now, subhanAllah, the level of, of courage and patience and sabr and steadfastness with each other and that they would say, we're not even going to talk about it because it's too painful. Because it's something we just have to look at our own weaknesses and our own shortcomings and just say, subhanAllah, So this, can you imagine one of the most difficult moments in your community the community has lost 70 of its of its best. And you're like, we can't discuss it. We won't mention it. We won't mention this day. 
We won't mention the passing of Musa. And so, uh, you know, of course, this is one of the darkest days in the life of our beloved Messenger of Allah, and yet, subhanAllah, this is uh, one of the greatest lessons for the Muslims, the bad world, how firm we have to be to hold on to the instruction of the Messenger of Allah, and for us to recognize the harm that could that could be that could be brought as a result of, of our disobedience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them and forgive us, guide them and guide us. May Allah elevate them and elevate us. May we truly learn from the battles, may we truly learn from the battle of God. And may Allah cause us to be victorious. And ultimately for us to realize that victory is with Allah. Hey, that subhanAllah, we were that they their days of Badr and their days of Uhud. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our iman steadfast every day. So I realize that people have done such grand things to defend the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to defend Islam. Alhamdulillah, and I understand how they would be deserving of a place uh, in Jannah near the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What advice do you have for people like us who are not in that position but still want a position near in Jannah near the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You know, subhanAllah, my hope is always in uh, the words of the Prophet وسلم, when one of his companions, you know, was sitting and weeping, he, you know, the Prophet وسلم, found him weeping and he asked him, what's wrong? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, like, you're going to be in the highest station in Jannah, right? And I'm just, I'm, I'm going to miss you. Like, I'm going to miss you. And, you know, he, he asked him, like, how far is it between one Jannah and the next? And he said, it's the distance between the earth and the sky. And he began to weep more. And he said, he said because Ya Rasulullah, you're going to be in the highest levels. And I, we're not going to be in those levels. And the Prophet وسلم, told them, you will be with whom you love. Right? And so that, and so that companion in the moment that the Prophet وسلم, said that, he got up and he danced. Right, and you'll be with who you love. Allah So our way is muhabba. Right? Our path is muhabba. That is true. We will never be able, uh, you know, to be like those who defended him in Badr or to be like those who defended him in Umutur, you know, to be like those who who build masajid with him. Um, but we can, you know, achieve proximity with Muhammad, well, with love of the Prophet Sallallahu with, of course, becoming close to him through his seerah by sending salawat on him by just constantly doing everything we can to increase our love and our proximity to him. How come the Quraysh prematurely determined the Prophet ﷺ had passed away? For example, did the Prophet ﷺ pretend, pretend to be dead as a strategy? No, he wasn't pretending. He was he felt unconscious that after the, the, the three blows that I mentioned um, had struck him very severely. So the one of them had almost... Uh, like dislocated his shoulder and then the next one he was he was struck if you can imagine that he was struck so heavily on one side of his face that uh chain you know that part a portion of his helmet was inside of his cheek and the last one was at the top of his head and they, it actually cracked uh his helmet and so at that point he fell down uh slightly like he was knocked out and so because he had fallen and was knocked out, they, they began to just spread the message that he had passed away, especially because they saw uh, the Muslims carrying him off. And so then they just kind of, you know, made that assumption. Uh, and subhanAllah wasn't, uh, yeah, and it, it wasn't until later that he actually woke up from those wounds from, from being unconscious. Uh, there's so many lessons in this battle of oh, alhamdulillah. I feel like I have to sit and reflect on it for a while because it's something that we can take in our personal lives and our personal community and relationships to help ourselves build unity with each other. Yes, subhanAllah. Yes, subhanAllah. Not leaving our posts, not leaving our positions until we're relieved, right? until we're given clear instruction. Uh, one of the things that I find personally um, like a, I guess you can say like a shining light in the battle of Uhud is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam positioned women 
in a position and during this battle that no one had ever done before. And it becomes the first battle that women uh, fight in, but it's not the last. Right, that women actually you find in uh, in the prophetic narrative, you find women in multiple positions inside of the Muslim army. You find them as nurses. You find them and in the in the role that they play, not just as I don't want to put that as like the role they play in nursing the wounded, uh, but were like surgery, right? In many cases, uh, you know, and, and helping. But then later on, you know, Omar Musayfa introduces something that is never imagined before that, that later we find Um Sulaim, the, the mother of Anis bin Manik, uh, fighting in the actual battlefield, right? Carrying a weapon and, and fighting on the battlefield. Just to say that women also can defend the life of the Muslims of Allah. And so, you know, not that we're calling all of the women to run out and be soldiers, but we but we find that, right, during the life of the Prophet Muhammad, Allah, uh, with a, and so it just begins to change the narrative. It's a different uh, understanding in terms of the importance and the value of the empowering of women for how even the Prophet included women in the battle even differently than the way the Quraysh did, right? Uh, not to use them you know, for negativity, but to say that we directly need their support. Um, was a was was a, a very big deal. So that's something that for me is always a shining, a shining light. <laughs> The clear lesson is to not misinterpret the commands of the Prophet Muhammad uh -huh. Since he is no longer with us physically, is there anyone today whose commands we should take as seriously as the companions took the commands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Mm -hmm. How do we know who these people are today? Allah bless you. Allah bless you. <laughs> the first way that you recognize them is that they themselves don't deviate from the way of the Prophet and that they themselves are firmly upon his prophetic example without uh, a reinterpretation, right? Recognizing that the Prophet is just as relevant, if not more relevant today in 2022 than, than you know, as he was during that particular time. Like it's never, he's the prophet to the end of time. He wasn't the prophet only for that time. And so for us to be able to recognize and to see that it's something that becomes, um, you know, necessary, that we have teachers in Shiyu uh, who give us instruction for how do we follow the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And once we, you know, we find the one that is, uh, that has the medicine for our particular heart or that has the key to our soul, that Allah has placed them in positions to be able uh, to guide us the right, then they are not to be disobeyed. They are not to be, uh, their words are not to be dismissed. Uh, and we find that, subhanAllah, not just, it shouldn't just be one teacher or one chef, we have many of them um, that we should, you know, look, we should look to and listen to for their leadership. And, and again, the way that we know them is that they themselves, we don't find deviating from the Quran, the prophetic example, that we find them not only be the, the, the verbal teachers of it, but we can watch and observe, and they also are the physical observers of that. And I, you know, um, subhanAllah, something that in our day and time is, is almost obedience is like a, a, a bad word. Right? And submission is like a bad word. But in reality, uh, our ability to recognize uh, the importance of Islamic leadership, right? And the ability to say, and I'm not talking about, you know, taqlid, like blind following. I'm saying open with your, eye, with your eyes, you know, <laughs> clearly open and pay attention, you know, who is, who is clearly... Uh, are in, in those positions and they're worthy of it because of their not deviating, right? Um, because of their strict adherence and their clear understanding of its guidance. And they're not calling you to anything that they themselves are not doing. Uh, so with your eyes wide open, pay attention to when those gyms uh, show up and if you are able to study them and then study with them, and if, you know, depending on what, the, and it's also, um, 
you will find it very rare that they will ever, they, you would never find them calling you to them, right? They never call to themselves. They never say, obey me. Hey, this is not, this is not, that's one of the biggest signs, right? They don't call to themselves. They actually call uh, to Allah and his messenger. And how do we, how do we become uh, clear adherents to Allah and his messenger? So that's another thing that, uh, that this kind of the guidance that they're asking for is not a guidance for them personally. It's a guidance for how do we adhere to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger. But when we find those great shiyu, right, those great shiyu, they should be listened to and adhered to. And they don't mind giving you their proof. <laughs> they have no problem with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be amongst those who are always guided and right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu wa sayyidina habibina munana muhammad. Wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma barahmatika thabbit kulubna ala dini thabbit a'damana ala surat al-mustaqeema. Ya Rabbi keep our hearts firm upon surat al-mustaqeem. Ya Rabbi keep us amongst those who are right. They guided and who don't deviate. Allahumma us to be able to recognize the truth for truth and falsehood for falsehood and give us the strength and the ability, Ya Rabbi, to adhere to the truth and the ability to discern the falsehood and the strength and the courage to avoid it. Ya Rabbi, make us amongst those who are Make us amongst those, Ya Rabbi, who adhere to this deen in the highest way with beautiful character. Ya Rabbi, beautify us with the son of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Give us a blessed life and a blessed ending when it's best, Ya Allah. Make us amongst those who are who are who are members of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are proud to say we are from amongst this Ummah. Ya Rabbi, bless us to be amongst those who unite the Ummah and who never divide it. Bless us to be amongst those who are means of light, Ya Rabbi, and truth. Ya Rabbi, and never a means of trial or darkness or affliction, Ya Allah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa na'anihi wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah.